This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Karen Armstrong is now a United Nations ambassador for the Alliance. She is increasingly invited to speak in Muslim communities, countries. In 2007, she was awarded a Medal of Arts and Sciences by the Egyptian government for her services to Islam under the auspices of the prestigious Al-Azhar Madrasa, the first foreigner to have been awarded this decoration. In the summer of 2007, she was invited by the Malaysian government to speak in the Kuala Lumpur, even though her books are banned there, and gave the, the Muse Lecture in Singapore. She also spoke at the Young President's Organization in Istanbul, and later that year gave the keynote address at an international conference on Islamophobia there. In January 2008, she visited Pakistan, where she gave lectures on Islam in Lahore, Islamabad, and Karachi to packed audiences. Karen Armstrong was awarded the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Medal in 2008 and the Leopold Lucas Memorial Prize at Tübingen University in 2009. She's a trustee of the British Museum and a fellow of the Royal Academy of Literature. In February 2008, she was awarded the Tez, TED Prize and is currently working with TED on a major international project to create, launch, and propagate a charter for compassion created online by the general public and for the general public, crafted by leading thinkers in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as well as in Bo Hinduism and Buddhism. This will be signed in the fall of 2009 by a thousand religious and secular leaders around the world. We're very privileged to have Karen Armstrong here in Santa Barbara. I should note that this is the first stop on an American tour promoting her newest book, The Case for God. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Karen Armstrong. Thank you. Well, what wonderful welcome uh, on this beginning of my tour in the United States. And we're talking an awful lot about God these days. Um, now, in previous uh, eras, before the advent of the modern period, um, people knew that it was very difficult indeed to speak about God. Um, they said you, it, 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 you couldn't really say uh, that God was good. Uh, what, does it, what does it mean uh, to say God is good? Uh, we talk about a good meal and a good person. Uh, but how can we apply that word to God, who's not only good having one of, as one of his many qualities, but his goodness itself? We have no idea what it can be to be an omnipotent being. They said God was not a being at all. You couldn't even say God was the supreme being because that simply meant that God was rather like us on the same level, but just the top of the series, the end of the series. Um, and Paul Tillich used to say that it's almost impossible to talk about God these days. Uh, because people immediately ask you, does he, ridiculous pronoun, exist? <laughs> um, and of course, he said, once that question is, has been asked, uh, you've, the whole idea of God as 
the symbolism of God has been lost. Uh, you, it, people like Thomas Aquinas, uh, the great Muslim theologians like Avicenna, uh, or the Maimonides in the Jewish tradition said you couldn't even say that God existed because our notion of existence is far too limited to apply to God. Um, and, but now we talk glibly about God as though he were a kind of boss or um, a, a collie. We know his likes and his dislikes. Um, and we know, uh, you know what, how he would have voted in an election. Um, we, we pray to him, um, asking him to uh, cure our sickness or, um, or, or to save our queen or uh, bless our nation. Uh, and we expect him to take our side in a war even though our opponents are also God's children and also presumably the object of his love and care. So, uh, and now, many people find it difficult to believe that God exists. And that word belief I'll be looking at a little bit later. It's changed its meaning over the years. Now, in the uh, 10th century before Christ, the people of India, India always being in the vanguard of religious change, developed a form of uh, way of talking about the ultimate in a way that I think is Marx's authentic religious discourse. It was called the Brahmoja competition. And it would begin with the Brahmin priests who were going to take part in it. By going out, they'd go out into the jungle and there they'd fast and they would do preliminary yoga exercises uh, to put themselves into a different frame of mind. You really can't talk about God in the same way as you discuss a business deal or have an argument uh, with, 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 with a friend. You have to put yourself into that more receptive mode of mind that we have, that we adopt quite naturally when we're read, reading a poem or listening to a piece of music, awakening those more intuitive uh, aspects that you can actually measure uh, with on, on, on a brain machine. Well, when they put themselves into a state of suitable consciousness, they would then return and the competition would begin. And the object of the exercise was to define the Brahman, the Brahman being the ultimate reality, way beyond the gods in the uh, nascent Hindu tradition. And uh, so a, the, the challenger would start and he'd give a very poetic and esoteric and a complex, beautifully calibrated definition of what he thought Brahman was. And his opponents would listen and they'd have to respond to his, his definition and come back and take it further and further. And the winner was the person who reduced his opponents to silence. And it was in that silence that the Brahman was present. The Brahman was not present in the wordy and brilliant definitions that were being uttered, but in that moment of stunning realization of the impotence of speech. Because we human beings push our minds it frequently into a state of transcendence, the wo a word which means to climb above, to get beyond what we can know. Our minds segue very naturally into transcendence. It's one of the peculiar characteristics of the human mind. And in fact, the desire to live constantly in relation to this transcendence is probably the defining a human characteristic. We, be, we humans are meaning-seeking creatures. And when we no longer find value or significance in our lives, we can fall very easily into despair. Dogs, as far as we know, don't spend a great deal of time agonizing about the canine condition 
or uh, fret about the afterlife or what happens to dogs in other parts of the world. But we do. We, this is both our blessing and our curse. And we also seek out experiences that touch us deeply within and lift us momentarily beyond ourselves at times when we feel we inhabit our humanity more fully than usual. Um, and we, we do this in art, in music, in sport. And religion was one of those activities. Um, music is, is, is an, uh, an obvious example. Music is a very cerebral, rational art. It's based very closely on mathematics, close relation to mathematics. Uh, very, very complex uh, interrelations of form. And yet, it goes naturally. This is what reason does when we push it beyond itself in, into a form of knowing that goes beyond logic and discursive proof. And we have that kind of knowledge every day, a kind of knowledge that you can't put into words. Um, and uh, so, uh, and music has been intimately related always with religion, which has always expressed itself best uh, in terms of art, poetry, architecture, dance, and music, rather than in logical discourse scientific discourse. And in the old days, people knew that there were two ways of arriving at truth, and the Greeks called them mythos and logos. Uh, logos was what we needed to function um, successfully and efficiently in the world. Uh, we've all, uh, it's uh, science. We've always needed science, even if only to sharpen an arrow correctly so that it meets its, its prey. We need science when we organize our societies or the economy. We need logos uh, to, to think uh, correctly about the external world. And so uh, logos speech must correlate very exactly and accurately to the external world or it won't work. But Logos has its limitations, and people in the ancient world understood this. They understood very well uh, that, it, say, if your child dies or you experience a terrible natural catastrophe, certainly you want a scientific explanation to know why this has happened. But you also want some help in uh, negotiating the turbulence of your grief and dismay and terror. And for that, people turned to mythos, myth, uh, which was not uh, it was stories about the gods often or about heroes, which were not intended in any way to be historical. Um, but they, uh, it's been, myth has been formed, called an early form of psychology. Um, people... Uh, noticed that Freud and Jung turned very instinctively to myth, the ancient myths, when they were developing their modern search for the soul. Those stories about gods threading their way through labyrinths and fighting monsters told people how to manage the internal world. They too had to enter the labyrinthine world of their psyche and fight their own demons. And this is the point. Myth is essentially a program for action. Uh, it is telling you what to do and how to behave. Now, during the scientific revolution, uh, starting in the 17th century, we, myth um, beca became discredited because science was beginning to achieve such spectacular results. And we started thinking that the only way to achieve truth was by empirical uh, proof. And this doesn't work for myth. And our notion of um, religion became notional. We started thinking that we could prove God's existence. Newton sort of believed that very definitely. And uh, that we, uh, we had to believe a whole lot of truths. In fact, we often call religious people believers as though that's their main activity. 
But this is a modern development and very eccentric. You don't find that same emphasis on belief in either Judaism or Islam. They are religions of practice uh, because myth is telling you how to behave. If you don't translate a myth into practical action, either ritually or ethically, the myth remains incomprehensible. And we've, uh, we lost that sense of religion being a form of practical knowledge, the result of spiritual exercises um, and certain ethical behavior. Um, there's certain things that you can't learn simply notionally. You can't learn to drive a car uh, simply by reading the car manual or studying the rules of the road. You've got to get into the vehicle and learn how to uh, steer and manipulate the brakes. I've never learned to drive a car, so I, I, I know. Um, you, uh, cooking, again, is something you, you, you can't... You can't, you can't a, become a good cook simply by reading recipe books, nor can you become a good dancer or a swimmer or an athlete uh, by studying. You have to get into the pool and learn to float, you acquire the knack. And if you're going to be a good dancer or a gymnast, you have to practice hour and hour, day after day. And that is telling us uh, that uh, the... the, the and what, what happens is that you can, if you're talented and you work hard enough, you can learn to do things that would have seemed initially impossible. When we look at the way a dancer or it leaps into the air, it seems inhuman. But she has simply uh, used a human uh, skill and honed that skill to achieve an unearthly perfection and grace. Religion is hard work. And the doctrines of the faith, the myths of our faith, even myths like the incarnation or the trinity, were telling us what to do. And if we don't do the spiritual exercise involved, we don't get the meaning of the doctrine. And doctrine becomes opaque, incomprehensible. Um, now, today, we've rather reversed the thing. First, you have to believe uh, in uh, a whole set of doctrines, and then you start putting it into practice. Not much point in um, living a religious life if God doesn't exist. Uh, but that would be, for people like the Buddha or even Jesus, this would be putting the cart before the horse. Um, first, you practice then you begin to understand what it's all about. Now, belief, let's have a look at this. Um, the word belief, used believen in Middle English, used to mean to love. It was related to the German Liebe, beloved, uh, or the Latin libido, desire. Um, it meant, it, it had connotations of loyalty, fealty, commitment. Um, uh, in, in Shakespeare, uh, one of uh, the char character in the All's Well That Ends Well says to the young hero, believe not thy disdain. Uh, the hero is in love with, you know, is, is being forced to marry a very low-born girl. Believe not thy disdain. That means don't entertain it. Don't play with your disdain. Don't let it take root in your mind. Um, now, believen was, belief was used by, by the King James uh, people when they translated the Bible into English to translate the Greek pistis, uh, which meant commitment, loyalty, engagement, involvement, trust. And the Latin credo, which came from cordo, I give my heart. Um, when Jesus is asking his disciples for belief, he's not asking them to believe that he's the son of God. Uh, he's asking for commitment. He wants people who will uh, sell all they have and give it to the poor. 
who will follow him and be prepared to, to live rough, to devote their whole lives to the kingdom, to live compassionate lives, um, to live like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, trusting in the, the God who is their father, Pistis, trust. Uh, he's, he's not asking for doctrinal assent. Um, St. Anselm in the 11th century uh, right, wrote a very famous prayer in which he said, credo ut intelligam. That is usually translated, I believe in order that I may understand. And I always understood this to mean that first you had to bludgeon your mind to accept a whole a range of doctrines, and then that act of intellectual submission would mean that you um, uh, would, would, would begin to understand something as a kind of reward. Uh, but Anselm is saying something else, and you see it quite uh, clearly in the context of that, that remark. Credo et intelligam should really be translated, I engage myself, I involve myself, and then I will understand. And unless I so involve myself, he goes on to say, I will not understand. You have to do faith in order to get it. And by reversing the whole thing, uh, we've made it very difficult for ourselves. Uh, the Quran, for example, has not much time for uh, sort of orthodox theology. It calls it zanna, self-indulgent guesswork about matters that nobody can be certain of one way or the other, but which makes people quarrelsome and stupidly sectarian. <laughs> now, we're, now, the fact that we are so literal-minded these days makes things very difficult for us. Nobody before the 17th, 18th century took the first chapter of Genesis as a literal account of the origins of life. Um, it, the people, the, 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 there, there, are, there are several creation myths in the gospel, in, in, in the Bibles. Uh, they can't all be true. Um, cosmology in the ancient world, that is a creation story in the ancient world, was not giving us information about uh, the Earth's origins. Uh, cosmology was, remember the, the psychological import of myth, uh, cosmology was basically therapeutic. A creation myth would be recited when people felt the need for um, an infusion of the enormous power and force that had somehow brought something out of nothing. And so they would recite these stories um, at a deathbed uh, or when they were starting a new uh, settlement or building a boat when they felt the need for, for creativity. Some of the creation myths tell you what you have to do in order to be creative yourself. Others speak about the immense effort that is required uh, to, um, to, to, to run your society and to keep cosmic and, and cosmic order. People were very concerned about uh, outrunning the Earth's resources in the ancient world, how right they were. Um, and the, f the first chapter of Genesis was written in the 6th century while the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. And it's a gentle satire on Babylonian religion, which must have been balm to the exile's bruised spirits. Um, and it's also its vision of a cosmos where everything has its distinct and clear place must have been consoling to um, a displaced people. But we know that other exiles at this time much preferred a quite different cosmological story, which has Yahweh fighting sea monsters like other uh, Middle Eastern gods in order to create a viable world, a viable cosmos. Um, and as late as the 16th century, um, a Jewish mystic, Isaac Luria, uh, created an entirely new creation myth that bore no relation to Genesis in any respect at all. Um, and um, this was a terrible time for Jews. They were, had been at that time expelled from one region of Europe after another. And uh, this new creation myth of Luria's really reflected that arbitrary world, that frightening world that they now inhabited, better than this orderly 
uh, cosmology of Genesis 1. Now, if someone today created a new creation myth, there'd probably be hell to pay. You know, you can't contradict the Bible in this way. But this myth became the basis of a mass movement among the Jewish people from Poland to Iran. It was the only theology at that time in the Jewish world to win such universal acceptance. Um, Saint Augustine said uh, that uh, if a biblical text was found uh, to contradict science, you had to find a new interpretation of that text. You had to interpret it allegorically. Now, St. Augustine can be called the founder of Western Christianity. He's revered uh, by Catholics and Protestants alike. And that principle of Augustine's uh, was uh, common in uh, Europe. It was the recognized way of reading scripture right up until the 17th century. And right on the door, at the dawn of the, uh, the, the scientific revolution, you have Calvin saying uh, very angrily that there are some frantic persons, and I quote, who are trying to impede science and are disturbed that uh, some of the new scientists are contradicting scripture. For example, said Calvin, he doesn't seem to have heard about Copernicus. Uh, he, he doesn't mention him, but he said, look, uh, Pete, some of you are worried because the Bible says that the sun and the moon are the largest of the heavenly bodies, whereas now uh, we know that Saturn and Jupiter are much bigger. Uh, and, but, this, but, uh, but Calvin says the Bible is not teaching us anything about science. It has nothing to tell us about science. If you, science, he said, is very useful and it must not be impeded by these frantic persons. Um, and if you want to learn about cosmology or astronomy, go elsewhere. Now, what happened was that... Um, Newton, in the 17th century, felt that he'd found a proof for God's existence. The immense, the towering genius of Newton, who, dis who adumbrated the whole social, this whole uh, solar system, and the intricacy of which, he said, demanded an intelligent creator, an intelligent designer, uh, who was, and I quote, obviously very well skilled in mechanics and geometry. Now, this is the kind of thing that would have made Thomas Aquinas turn in his grave. Uh, Thomas Aquinas said yes uh, when he tried to prove God's existence. He said, yes, uh, you can say that something happened uh, to bring everything into existence. We don't know what that is. Uh, we, and originally, the doctrine of creation out of nothing which was first formulated by, in the Christian world only in the fourth century. Uh, the, the, the conclusion was that the creation could therefore tell us nothing about God because it came from nothing. And uh, matter, which comes from nothing, has no relationship to the God that is being itself. Um, now, uh, the, but the church people, uh, and the, the, the churchmen, theologians, who were so impressed by Newton and so lured and attracted and drawn to the ideal of this absolute cast iron certainty, that they adopted this scientifically based theology and made Newton's God and later William Paley's intelligent designer absolutely central to the Christian vision. And they lost the older habits of thought, that Brahmodya thought, because Christians in the, had evolved their own form of Brahmodya competition to make us realize the inadequacy of our speech when we talk about God and to segue into silent awe. Um, and we lost those older habits of thought. And so when Darwin came along, people were thrown for a loop. And, um, and didn't know. It wouldn't have been a disaster, Darwin. Uh, you know, as St. Augustine would have said, right, find a new interpretation then to, to Scripture. This, this 
must keep abreast of science. So we've got ourselves into a mess. Um, and, but really, I think we just need to get back to the idea of religion being practice, uh, above all. Above all, all the world religions have insisted that at the core of, the, of religiosity, at the, core, the authentic test of any spirituality is compassion and the golden rule. My favorite story is the story of Rabbi Hillel, the older contemporary of Jesus, who, when asked by a pagan if he could recite the whole of Jewish teaching while he stood on one leg, uh, said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the Torah, and everything else is only commentary. Go and study it. A remarkable statement. No mention of the existence of God, uh, the creation of the world, Mount Sinai, the Exodus, nothing that we associate uh, with Judaism, but the golden rule. If you do that, you get the whole of it. Jesus made the same point when asked, what is the greatest commandment? Um, and the first person to, to formulate the golden rule was Confucius. Uh, 500 years before Christ, he was asked by his disciples, Master, which of your teachings can we put into practice all day and every day? What's the central thread that runs through all your teaching and pulls it all together? And Confucius said, Shu likening to the self. Look into your own heart, discover what it is that gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. Do not do to others what you would not like them to do to you. And if we did that every second of the day, if every, all day and every day, not just doing your good deed for the day, as we often say, but all day and every day, if every time we were threatened to say something vile about an annoying colleague or a, an ex-wife or a nation with whom we're at war, and then said, how would we like this said of us, and desisted, in that moment, we would have transcended ourselves, transcended the ego that holds us back from knowledge of the divine. And if we did it all day and every day, we would live in a state of what the Greeks called ecstasis, which didn't mean an exotic trance. Uh, ecstasis means stepping outside, standing outside, standing outside the prison of egotism. And we, if we were doing this all day and every day, we wouldn't have time to worry about the existence of God. We would know what God was, uh, though we would never be able to express it in rational terms. So um, I think um, when we made uh, God provable, we made atheism a distinct possibility. Uh, because science is, uh, religion is, and mythos and logos are, that they're separate. Uh, they have different jobs to do. They are not in conflict. Um, and there was no conflict between science and religion until the late 19th century. We had the odd blip with people like Galileo uh, but um, in, during the scientific revolution, religion and science were in love with one another um, and tried almost to marry and to mate and in a way that wasn't helpful. Um, and so basically, once you, religion is not about, it never was about telling us things, in giving us information about things that we could discover by our own natural reason. It was about helping us to find a way of living with um, realities for which there were no easy answer. With pain, mortality, bereavement, sorrow, suffering. And to live in that, in relation to that uh, creatively, as you see Jesus doing on his death, in agonizing death and despair, 
having time for a kindly word with one of his fellow victims, uh, having time to make provision for his mother, um, and owning his death, uh, living, dying in a compassionate way. Um, science can help us to uh, cure our sickness, and it can help us to diagnose a sickness, but it cannot help us to die well, and it cannot help to assuage that moment of grief and terror and disappointment when we get our, uh, the bad diagnosis. Uh, for this, we ha and religion is hard work. Uh, it's not just a question of bopping into church and singing a few hymns. It requires an effort all day and every day. Uh, but it can be done. We can, my, my charter for compassion that was mentioned, is really about restoring compassion to the centrality of the religious life. Um, and I also feel it's absolutely essential for our world. Religion should be making a major contribution to one of the chief uh, tasks of our time, that is to build a global community where people can live together in harmony and respect. And um, if, if, but often religion is seen as part of the problem. Um, so let's bring compassion back to religion. Let's remember Hillel and Confucius saying this is the essence of religiosity, not believing abstruse doctrines, but putting what those doctrines, I've tried to do this in my book, trying to show how, what, those, what the action that those doctrines like Trinity and Incarnation were, and indeed creation were meant to inspire. Um, and I, and then we discover a, a rich enhancement of our being. Just as a dancer discovers new capacities by exercising uh, physically and taking her body, uh, people in, into extraordinary uh, uh, dimensions, so too religious people who have practiced compassion all the time experience an enhancement of being. That is the natural proof, if you like, for the reality of religion of what we call God. And I close my book with this lovely story about the Buddha. Um, one day he was sitting in, in a clearing, meditating, and a Brahmin priest came along and said to him, um, he'd never seen a, a person with such composure and strength and control and serenity. And he said, are you a God, sir? No, said the Buddha. Are you, uh, are you an angel? A spirit? No, said the Buddha. Well, what are you? And the Buddha said, look, um, this, this is not something that, it's not a formula, but I've discovered a new way of being human, of living, activating all aspects of our humanity that normally lie dormant. And so when the Brahmin priest said, well, who are you then? He said, think of me, I, I, I'm awake. He had awoken a whole lot of aspects of his humanity that we often don't tap, just as there are parts of our, our brain, scientists tell us, that we're not using. And I think that is the secret of religion. There's no point in having barren arguments about evolution. Uh, but to live in a compassionate way and to create a more compassionate world and an enhanced, spiritualized humanity. That's what the incarnation means, uh, that you cannot think God without thinking human, and you cannot think human without thinking God. Thank you. I'm just wondering if we uh, could have morality without religion. Yes. Uh, yes. So you could... why do we need religion? Uh, well, religion isn't just about morality. Uh, religion is, uh, you, I don't think you, can, you, need to be, you certainly don't need to believe in God in order to be good. But if you want, um, 
I don't know, transcendence, I think, is, 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 is part of what uh, religion is about. That, as I was saying earlier, that sense that you are uh, inhabiting a, a different dimension of existence. The idea of a supernatural, the, the supernatural, is a modern idea. Uh, before the modern period, people were at great pains to point out that uh, what we call Brahman or, uh, was also Atman, the deepest core of every single creature. Uh, incarnation, as I've just said, was about talking about the fusion of humanity and the divine. Um, so, but the idea of, a deep, of cultivating a deeper inwardness, exploring uh, what we, we call in another metaphor the interior world, uh, that, is, that is too why we need religion. It's an art form religion in many ways. It's about the, it's about the discovery of meaning. Um, and uh, you know, you can be a moral person without having any artistic leanings at all. I really haven't heard any atheists that started a war. Really? Um, well, I don't, uh, Stalin didn't do so badly. Um, he didn't start a war, but he did um, happen to murder quite a large number of people. Um, I think um, most, uh, uh, you just had two questions. Um, um, most of the religiously articulated violence that we are wit sadly witnessing now uh, is largely politics. Most what we call fundamentalism is often a sort of uh, a, f a religiously articulated form of nationalism or ethnicity. And the religious bias, religiously articulated violence that we are seeing now has mostly taken root it's begun in regions where warfare, originally a, a purely secular conflict, has become chronic. The Middle East, a uh, typical uh, uh, argument about a land uh, on both sides, defiantly secular. Uh, Zionism was originally a, um, a rebellion against religious Judaism. And, uh, the PLO ideology was secular. Uh, but uh, after, as it festers, it festers, it festers. As same in Afghanistan, uh, another region lost to violence. A religion therefore gets sucked in and becomes a part of the problem because violence um, affects everything we do. It affects our fantasies and our uh, aspirations and our relationships. Uh, our daydreams, and it affects our religion also. Um, so, um, basically, every single one of the world traditions uh, that we know now uh, uh, took root, began in societies like our own, where violence had reached a, uh, an appalling level. And they were all in the t recoiling from the violence of their time and promoting the compassionate ethos as a means of countering that violence. Ms. Armstrong, it seems to me that religion, as we commonly understand it in the world, is the problem. That most religious leaders what you are suggesting, that this is, God is not something of which we can speak. It's a transcendental, it's an existential experience. Hmm. I don't know many religious people that speak that way. No, that's, that's my religion point. Religion is a problem. That's, that, that is my point. And there's, they're very, like art, uh, religion is difficult. Uh, that you don't always do it well. Not everybody who takes piano lessons ends up sounding like Vladimir Ashkenazi. Um, and religious leaders, uh, and this is a vast generalization, are often politicians, uh, monkey, uh, but religious politicians, if you like. And they, politicians are not known for their lack of ego. Um, and it's e the problem is ego. 
What we're seeing a great deal uh, is a religion to back up identity. Uh, you know, it makes me who I am and all the rest of it. And we use God, a bad image of God, an inadequate idea of God, to prop up our own beliefs. Um, you know, uh, the Crusaders went into battle crying, God wills it when they murdered Jews and Muslims. This is an idolatry. Uh, it, creating an image, a, a, a God in your own image and likeness. Ref projecting all your loathing onto another uh, a, a, an imaginary being, idolatry. Uh, so this is this is bad religion, or I, that, that's a bit sort of not very kind, is it? It's unskillful religion, as the Buddhists would say. <laughs> um, and so, uh, because religion is religion is difficult to do well, and people think it's easy, um, or, or they use it in a facile way, or they use it to prop up their identity. It, it's 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 losing it. It loses its valency. Um, but re religion is part of what we do. One of the first, you know, as, as uh, it's one of the first signs that you have uh, of hum of hu Homo sapiens sapiens, as they say, coming into being, are uh, is evidence of some kind of ritual. Um, and so it, it is something we do. Uh, so trying to get rid of it is like trying to get rid of art. Are you going to get rid of all art or drama just because some people write really bad plays? Uh, no. Uh, the thing to do is to try and help people to create better plays. What was the first <laughs> thinking that uh, you wanted to leave the nunnery? What are you actually asking? What? No, I, would, I was just saying that. No, you with moved the, on my that. religious order sent me to Oxford. Oh. Okay. Uh, to, because I was going to be, the, ob, the, uh, the idea was that I would become a teaching nun, that I would teach in one of their schools. And uh, my order was a very progressive order, and it had been sending nuns to Oxford University ever since women had been allowed to take degrees. And in fact, my convent was the first home, as it were, of what eventually became my college, St. Anne's College. So I went to Oxford, and I, uh, for the first half of my undergraduate career, I was a nun. And then I had a breakdown. I collapsed. I couldn't go on. Um, I, it was a minor breakdown. I mean, I, was, I didn't have to go to hospital or anything, but I was quite sick. And it became... Uh, apparent both to me and my superiors that this was, uh, I had to go. Uh, it wasn't right for me, and I think I'd known it for a long time, but it was very sad. I didn't leap out joyfully. I try, I, part of the breakdown was that I didn't want to leave at all. I was very frightened of leaving. I thought it would be easy. Uh, I, I, I knew it wouldn't be easy, and I, I was right. It was awful, and for about six years, I existed in a state of grief, rather like a d bereavement or a divorce. Um, and then I thought I'd finished with religion altogether. But uh, by, after a series of further career disasters, I found myself uh, writing books about religion, and <laughs> uh, that's another story. I would urge all people like to apply your brilliance to the problem we have in the Middle East because it's very upsetting and I'd like to know what's going on with this temple they want to build and please somebody explain it all to me. Yeah, well I've written about those things already. Um, you can look at my um, history of Jerusalem for example uh, to find out about that temple etc. So I think uh, this, I, I, well I am engaged in this kind of peace initiatives uh, throughout both the Middle East and the Muslim world. Um, and that's uh, largely something you have to do, and again, practice, uh, rather than just keep writing. It means going and talking to people, uh, trying to break down prejudices, uh, trying to shift people's positions, uh, move things in people's minds, and that's, uh, I spend a great deal of my time on, on, the, on those kind of activities. Uh, and, um, Okay. 
My church is having the privilege of hosting uh, Bishop John Shelby Spong at hmm. a lecture series uh, in February. And uh, I thought, just as one religious luminary on another, would you have a few choice words? Oh, on, on, on John? Mm -hmm. Jack. Oh, he's a dear friend of mine. Um, Jack Spong is great. Uh, I think um, he's a little bit of a literalist himself. Um, I think he reads his scriptures very li literally and uh, is still slightly stuck in that mode, but he's done valuable work in dismantling some of the more uh, uh, really valuable work, in dismantling uh, some of the more outrageous things people are asked to believe. But now the next thing to do is how you build it up. And when we are, I've asked him that, he says, that's your job. <laughs> Morality without religion is the worst form, I think, of fundamentalism. You do this or zap. Oh, I don't. That's, oh. that's, that's, bad. that's you know, that kind of religion where we're just reduced to fear is extremely unskillful and it, it reduces us to inf inf oh. infantile behavior. Um, and that's why I think uh, the obsession with the afterlife, for example, uh, you know, with, you can wreck your religious life. Um, because I was obsessed as a child about going to hell. You know, this threat of hell and, uh, you know, he hanging over me. And this is not the way uh, to encourage uh, creativity or a adulthood or... Uh, and basically, it's about ego. A religion is supposed to be about the... Um, loss of ego, the transcendence of ego, not endlessly fantasizing about its eternal survival in optimum conditions. Um, so, I was just wondering if prayer originally would have been categorized as part of the mythos or the logos, especially like communal prayer. Oh, a my mythos. And, and what you call communal, or we say communal uh, over where I come from, um, uh, communal, uh, liturgy and uh, ritual, crucial. But unfortunately, in our uh, societies, uh, we've become very wordy in our prayers. Uh, you know, instead of the silence or, or rituals that give you some space, uh, we're endlessly telling God that he created the world and that we are miserable sinners, and as, as though this may have sli slipped his mind. Um, and um, I, you, you, there's, a, there's a, a little bit in, pas in, in Passage to India, do you remember when Mrs. Moore goes into the caves and hears the om, om, oh, and, and, and the, uh, confronts the nothingness and nullity of life? She says she can find no help in poor little talkative Christianity. Um, and I think we need somehow to get back to the idea that words, uh, you, you, you're right there, that's an interesting point, that if we, are, if we tr transmute our prayers into too much logos, where we're sort of bargaining with God and asking for this and that and the other, and not enough using words in order to push ourselves into silence, into silent awe and wonder, uh, then we, we, we might be losing the plot. Uh, because ritual is supposed, I mean, the, like any uh, theatrical experience, where, which can lift you up with music and, and, and moment, give you intimations of something greater. Uh, that is what ritual, like theology, should be. Uh, and it should, uh, a theolo modern theologian has said that theology is speech that has become silent. And ritual should do the same to us. Prayer should do the same to us. <laughs>